Imagine a world where every time you spend money, you get wealthier. The next time you buy a new pair of Jordans, something of Amazon, or that new Call of Duty game, you become a shareholder for free. You wouldn't think twice, right? Welcome to Bits of Stock, the next generation of customer rewarding. And welcome as well, everybody, to What's Next, our podcast and blog series about startups and innovation. My name is Giovanni Vaccari. I am head of product here at Startup Bootcamp. And today, we will be interviewing our alumnus Bits of Stock, represented by their founder and CEO, Arash Asadi. Welcome, Arash. Thanks for having me, Gio. So, pleasure is all ours. Uh, first question, can you tell us about, I mean, I already kind of spoiled the surprise there, but can you tell us a little bit about the story behind Bits of Stock? Like what brought you to make Bits of Stock? Yeah, sure. And I think you did a great introduction, by the way, almost Thanks. as good as mine. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, so Bits of Stock is a, a consumer rewards platform that drives loyalty through what we call stock rewards, which are fractional shares of public and privately held companies. Um, we started the company three and a half, four years ago in New York City. At the time, I was uh, working on Wall Street as a, as a fixed income and rates derivatives trader and, you know, got sick of staring at eight screens and watching movie, money move around with no purpose. Uh, and and my, I met my co-founder at NYU Stern at the time I was finishing my MBA. He was doing his master's of computer science. And to, together, you know, we had this shared passion for finance and technology. Um, and, and we noticed that a lot of our peers just did it. And, and we love to talk about stocks and we love to talk about investments you know, geeking out to, to all kinds of like investment opportunities and asset classes. And then we, we wondered why our peers weren't as interested and, and aren't, didn't really invest because we saw it as such an important, you know, vehicle for financial independence and retirement and long-term wealth. And so we set out to solve, to, to solve this problem. And, and, you know, the first part is identifying that it is a problem. So once you do the research at the time, 80% of millennials were not investing in stocks at all. Wow. Um, yeah, so, so that it was a huge problem, and, and that's gotten a lot better you know, over the past three, four years. But when you really dig into the reasons why they're not investing, you, know, you start to see a lot of insights that become very interesting. And, and, and there's a lot of different you know, platforms out there trying to solve this problem, but we decided to focus on what are the behaviors that are driving millennials not to invest, and what are they competing with? Yeah. You know, and, and then when it comes down to it, it's all about consumption and, and the, the the behavior that we're competing with is consumption. These millennials are spending, and it's not just millennials anymore, it's also Gen Z. Gen Z, um, I think uh, estimates of $1.3 trillion in purchasing power over the next few years. Um, So that's gonna be a big category of shoppers coming into the market, and we have to make sure that they're not just consuming, investing at the same time. So how can we build uh, good investment habits on top of habits they already have? Um, And that was really the premise for Bits of Stock, and then that became well, it turns out that these brands that these um, young shoppers are spending money with are also spending hundreds of billions of dollars on marketing, rewards, yeah. and loyalty programs trying to get us to do one thing and one thing only, which is to spend. And so we thought, well, if you look at the marketing value chain, you know, how can we redistribute some of that value back into the pockets of younger cons- shoppers and consumers and do it in a way that it's a win-win for all parties mm-hmm. involved? Because if you start you know, thinking about the long-term wealth of your consumers, you're going to increase the purchasing power that they have over time. And some of that purchasing power is going to come back to you as yeah. a brand um, yeah. and, and not your competitors. And that's, that's, real, that's true lifetime loyalty. So that was the premise of Bits of Stock was how can we build um, lifetime loyalty for brands um, that, that, that are trying to engage younger consumers, but also help these younger consumers build long-term wealth at the same time. It's very interesting what you bring because indeed we are talking about a generation that we always say that we are the best served generation on on the terms of opportunities in the sense that you can buy or do pretty much anything but at the same time you can do anything except uh get rich in the long term <laughs> like you you live from paycheck to paycheck normally as, as as a young professional out there and but how do you think that that uh that bits of stock is helping change that like are you plugging into the consumer behavior really well i think it starts with um you know touching these younger consumers at the point of sale. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, we know it's really hard to get you to change, you know, your behavior and habits of, of, of consuming or, or, or not really saving for your future. Um, and, and we're not going to compete with that. But mm-hmm. what we can do is try and get you at the point of sale to also put away a little bit of your money into, into the, the future, essentially, um, and start building wealth as, as you shop. I think that's, that's step number one. Step number two is then once you do own a bits of stock, 
um, in the brands that you're shopping with, how do we get you to come back into the app and engage with that stocks, learn about stocks? Um, what does it mean to own stocks? What does it mean to sell stocks, earn dividends, pay your taxes on those stocks? You know, really yeah. introducing you into the world of finance and stocks um, without you even thinking about it. Um, so I think once once we get over those first two steps, then you can really think about you know retirement funds and putting away money for your kids. And, and, and as our consumers grow, you know, we want to help support their life decisions and, and, and wealth savings behavior over time as well. It's really, instead of trying to change the system, it's just making the system a little bit more inclusive and diverse for that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our vision for, for the company and, and the impact that we want to make on the world is we want to build what we call an ownership economy. And that's an economy where consumers um, that, that participate in that economy are also owners in, in the economy they participate in through ownership. Um, so there's no reason why you know, we as consumers who are driving this economy can't also reap the benefits of being owners of, of that capital as well. Uh, there can be a win-win solution. And so as we try and build out this ownership economy, that's really where we think we can have a, a wide you know, impact on wealth inequality. If you look at wealth inequality, it disproportionately impacts younger generations. Absolutely. You know, and, and the way governments uh, and corporates have really try to solve this problem is through short-term incentives, cash payouts, subsidies. Um, but no one's really talking about equity distribution you no. know, and, and, and the future of, of long-term wealth for those people who are actually impacted by wealth inequality. It's and, really short fixes, right, that we're allowed to have. It's just like patches. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and so, so how do we actually make an impact that lasts? And I think this is a really good start. That's awesome. Uh, my question to you, of course, goes to a little bit towards Startup Bootcamp. You've done not one, but two programs with Startup Bootcamp. That's pretty awesome. So I think it's a nice statement as well to the value. What were the biggest challenges you were here to fix? Like, what were you here to do twice? Well, actually, it's interesting enough. When we joined the first program and Startup Bootcamp, we were scouted in New York by the MD at the time. Yeah. And when we were brought to Amsterdam, we actually had a different value proposition. We we're working on a different product. So the initial original product we were working with was a social trading app yeah. where people can copy the trades of their peers. And interesting enough, the thesis was that, you know, if you're if you don't know how to invest, well, what better way to start investing through copying your friends and people who might know what they're talking about and and socializing it. And I think we were a bit too early for the market at that time. If you look at what the trends that are going on now. It, you, you start seeing a lot of new social trading platforms 100%, and apps yeah. popping up and, and gaining some traction. Now, I don't know how, how they're going to do over time, but it, it's certainly much more thematic these days. But you also but, see that feature popping into existing apps, exactly, right? Like exactly. as a standalone solution. Yeah, I think socializing uh, your mobile app in, in one form or another can, can apply to many different business models and, and use cases. So it's, it's a great way to build engagement, retention, um, virality, et cetera. But... When we joined Startup Bootcamp, we ended up pivoting to bits of stock. And I think one of the challenges we needed to really overcome was getting that good, strong grounding as a team. You know, And that's what Startup Bootcamp did. They put us all in the same room every day for five days, six days a week over a few months. And you know, every day you're working towards the same goals as a team. And I think that really helped us find our value proposition and exactly what, how do we want to solve the problems that we, we've identified and, and helped us start from scratch, You know, going back to that business model canvas from yeah. day one, even after, you know, even after you've been working on an idea for three, six months, it's always good to go back to the drawing board, start from scratch, business model canvas, what are the problems you're actually solving, how? Um, and that's what really, that's the challenge that Startup Bootcamp helped us overcome from the start. And do you still do that? Do you still revisit your, biz, your BMC? We haven't done a BMC in, in quite, we do other things. Um, uh, you know, it's actually funny enough, whenever we want to work with a, a brand as a brand partner, we do um, business model canvases, but for them and figure out what, you know, what are the problems that we're solving for this customer and how can our solution help that customer? So it's a, it's a great tool, but I think, you know, subconsciously as an entrepreneur, you're always doing that anyway. Yeah. And I mean, bits of stock has grown pretty massively since the days of Startup Bootcamp, since pivoting. And I would like to hear some name dropping. So if a millennial, a Jay-Z or just any person right now joins bits of stock and they want to get stocks from uh, companies it's from 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 purchasing products let's say or, yeah. or or whatever they they buy nowadays from which brands can they get this return yeah so so currently if you download bits of stock um on ios android in the united states um one of the most exciting brands we signed recently was zara um so, oh, wow. so zara us online or in store next time you shop with zara you'll get these stock rewards fractional shares of stock rewards all you have to do is link your bank account walk into a zara shop 
Um, and, 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 it's, and obviously it's been a huge uptick for us in terms of our um, women using the app and, and yeah. downloading it and shopping and earning stocks, which that's a whole sub-segment of younger generations that is even more underinvested and, and can really benefit from a program like this. Um, so Zara, you know, you can go to Five Guys. We did a really funny video on Five Guys um, on TikTok. Actually, uh, it's like a little skit where um, the whole the whole play is, you know, if you walk you walk into a Five Guys and you as as a, as a as a someone that's just going there to eat, um, but now that you've gone to Five Guys, you've you've used bits of stock, and now you're a partial owner of Five Guys, right? Yeah. And so you can go in there and you know check on the employees and see if everything's clean and <laughs> and, and, and see what see see if everything's running smoothly and yeah. then. You know, and then we tell them you should change the name to Six Guys. But Five Guys is one of the <laughs> most exciting brands we've we've actually had um, in the app. Um, we have Pizza Hut. It's a lot, a lot of a few different fast food chains. We've had McDonald's. Um, so, so really, we try and find brands where we know younger demographics have a high touch point with high frequency brands. That the That's brands that smart. people are shopping with every day, or or for their for their for their food needs, et cetera. Um, We'll introduce Uber Eats uh, in the next few months as well. That's going to be big, I think, for a lot of a lot of people like me who don't cook at home and, and oh no, for Uber sure, Eats all the time. Yeah. The pandemic definitely destroyed every will I had to cook. Yeah. I think it's yeah. uh, I'm surviving on Uber Eats here. Exactly, and you saw that right with a lot of um, you know consumption being shifted over to these f food delivery apps, gr grocery delivery apps that are now trying to take over the world. Yeah, um, but, but it's also you know this 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 new generation we. We're very overworked, and that's not just us talking about it. It's very data driven, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, it's it's we have to work a lot for to earn basically what our parents would have earned working. Well, let's say a fraction of the hours, and and the money is worth less. So I think that to include this on the on the on the point really of that that financial exchange that you don't need to do an extra step. That's just super smart, and and brings it opens doors. And I love what you say that it opens doors as well to women to invest and something that it would be an underserved market beforehand. Um, my question to you is, is it US based only or are you open as well in more countries? So currently you can download the app in the United States, Netherlands and Belgium. Um, there are a few differences though, um, based on the markets that you're in. And that's really due to regulatory constraints that, that each market obviously presents. Um, and we're currently in the process of getting our own licenses here in the Netherlands um, to be able to do fractional shares of publicly listed companies in the EU. And that's something okay. quite exciting because you don't really, there really are no brokers in the EU doing real fractional shares of, of no EU publicly listed companies. And so we're, it's a bit of a race right now to see which, which neo broker will release it first, especially here in the Netherlands. I know who it will be, but we'll definitely be number, number two um, cool. in, in, in the EU. But what we can do right now is um, work with privately held companies. So as I mentioned, stock rewards are private and public companies. So mm -hmm. currently, if you look at uh, the Netherlands, we, we've partnered with Blocker early on for their program called Blockchain Blocker, which is a uh, which is a new program that they actually just released a few weeks ago, a really strong uptake. But essentially, as a shopper in Blocker, you can, you can download the Blocker app, earn points when you shop with Blocker, and then You know, if you want to convert those points um, to a new toaster or, or coupons, you can. But then another option will be converting those points into into shares of Blocker. And that's that's something that our technology powers with Blocker. And we have a few more brands, private brands like Blocker in the Netherlands that will soon onboard onto onto the platform. And I think what's really exciting there is that these private companies will IPO eventually. Yeah. You know? So companies even like Blocker has been signaling. Uh, an IPO next year in the market. And so those people who are earning shares in Blocker now as part of this loyalty program will have a nice payday when the IPO does happen uh, next year. And that's and that's that's going to be a really strong financial return for most of these shoppers. You know, instead of using those points for a discount or something, they're actually using these points and converting them to shares that will have a really good payout and helping them build wealth over time. Oh, super cool. And yeah. my question to you, you said the word regulatory. And that rings a lot of questions to me. How has how has this journey been for you to get you know regulated and and, and certified and all that and all that things? Yeah, so I think it's it's really difficult to start a company uh, as as an entrepreneur, tech tech company, um, you know, and you have all the challenges that you do as as a normal startup founder. But then you have this extra layer of complexity, which is compliance and regulations um, when you when you were in the and you're in the finance world, and you really need to have strong uh, professionals who've, who've dealt with these issues in the past, who have experience. Yeah. Uh, regulations is somewhere, is, a, is part of the startup journey that you can't fake it till you make it. No. You know, that this doesn't exist. Um, you can't fake regulations and fake regulators. Um, and, and for us, it was a, a large burden 
from the beginning. Um, you know, it's, and it's not just applying and getting approved for licenses. It's the compliance part after that. Mm-hmm. You know, we went through a one year audit by the SEC actually as part of a, because Whoa. we got a, we were a newly registered investment advisor in the United States. And soon after, you know, the SEC came knocking on our doors. Of you course. Know, like we want to, you know, just a routine check, routine check that ended up taking almost a year to, to complete. And I think that was a really good experience for us as a company because we learned, you know, excuse my French, how to get our shit together. Of course. From a company's perspective and be compliant, which now it's set us up really strong for the future. Um, but it was a very burdensome process. You know, when you're a small company, you have to devote 10, 20, 30 percent of your time just to comply with regulators and, and make sure everything is prepared the way it's supposed to be. It, it can it can slow you down as an entrepreneur. I think it can slow you down. But a lot of startups don't think about the fact that once you're working on com- with with compliance and compliance experts, they are also bulletproofing your company on the way. So, of course, it is a it is a pain. Uh, to go through with it, but you do come out as a stronger company. Not always. Sometimes there's just a bunch of paperwork that's that's just useless. No, but 100. percent I mean, we it was a growing pain for us, but we we came out much stronger. I mean, not you know, like as you said, bulletproof, making sure everything, all the documents are prepared properly and, and ready for reporting, et cetera. Putting in processes to to make sure you know compliance checks are being done throughout the business. So it it, it is it was a growing pain, but I'm I'm actually quite thankful we went through it. Cool. Yeah. And now what are the next challenges for Bits? Like what are you looking forward to, you know, solving next? Yeah, so I think we're, we're currently fundraising right now for our, for our Series A. So that will be closing a Series A round of financing will be huge for Bits of Stock. It'll be a rather large round of financing as well. And that's really going to help us be able to scale in, uh, in the United States as well as build out this fractional shares technology um, for publicly listed companies in Europe. That's going to be quite an exciting challenge to, to go through. Um, in the Netherlands. Um, so, so I think closing this round of f- financing and, and, and deploying capital is kind of what's next for us in the next three to six months, I would say. Um, and then the, ch- then the challenge is going to be maintaining that growth. And I think for us as a company, uh, you know, as most startups, you can really be, you can pivot quite quickly um, and, and, and not just pivot to a new different business models, but thinking about what kind of features, what kind of extra benefits to bring into to the platform. And so once you find some kind of some sort of product market fit, then the next challenge is, well, how do I take it to the next level? How do I double my growth after doubling my growth after doubling my growth? And I think for Bits of Stock, I'm quite excited for us to look into new types of asset classes, not just stocks. But, you know, we're the ownership economy doesn't mean ownership in just equity and companies. It can also mean um, cryptocurrencies, um, you know, NFTs, just fractional ownership as a, as a concept is something that I think Bits of Stock will lead um, when it comes to fintech in the next five years. And if I'm a young person now looking for learning more about investing, where should I go to? What should I learn first? Where, where, what's my first step? Yeah, so um, don't go to TikTok to learn about investing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the first advice I can give you. Um, you know, go to TikTok to understand the who, who's investing and what people are doing, but it's not investment advice. Because you are also on TikTok. We are, and, and, but we don't give investment advice on TikTok. We're not okay. telling you. We're, we're, we're giving you advice on what are some good financial habits to build over time. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're not telling you that, you know, these stocks are good investments um, on, on TikTok. Um, so so we're, we're actually creating content that's not, you know, I think with TikTok, the, the key is to, to focus on content that actually benefits the people that are watching it, not mm-hmm. just you as a brand, right? Yeah. So we're not on TikTok always talking how, about how BitStock is amazing, why you should use it. It's more about creating content that, we can we think can just impact the daily life of someone. Here, here are some five other websites you should check out for side Ooh. hustles, for example. You know things like yeah. that. So, but I diverted. Sorry, the, where, where should they go? I diverted it to talk about your TikTok plugin, your your <laughs> your social media. But where should they go to learn? Actually, um, you know the, the the exchanges themselves have really good websites that you can watch tutorials on on how to invest um, and 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 what does it mean to invest in stocks, et cetera. There are a lot of good books. Um, that, that I would recommend, one of which is called The Intelligent Investor. It's, it's one of the classics in, in, in finance. Um, it's a bit heavy, but it'll give you a really good introduction to investment basics. Um, so I think there's, picking up a book, there's a lot of good books on where to start investing in, in financial advice that are, that are um, really good tools. And also, if you look at some of the some fintechs out there, there's a lot of good investment management fintechs you know, that will take your funds 
take your, take, put, take some of your money, put it into a portfolio of, of stocks and ETFs that, that are, you know, um, optimized for your risk tolerance and mm-hmm. meaning, you know, how much risk that you think you can take based on your net worth, your income, et cetera, and, and put together a good plan to, to invest uh, over time for, for, for your future. I think something that happens that's pretty magical is you no longer have to understand it. Yeah. You can just collaborate and bring it to a platform. Like for some bits of stock, of course, I don't have to understand what I'm doing. I'm just spending as I would spend normally and I can get into this world. Like, Yeah, exactly. And I think that the benefit also that bits of stock brings is that you don't need to have the money to to invest, start investing either. You know, that's, that's the, the threshold sometimes. It's crazy high. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if you, there's two things there, right? This concept of fractional shares technology, which, mm-hmm. which is really giving access to um, a, a large portion of the population that couldn't afford to invest in stocks in the first place, not just in the United States, all over the world. And that's something that's mainstream now in the United States, it's been around for 10 years, but it's just starting to come to, come to Europe and other places in the world. So, so that technology allows you to buy, you know, five cents of Amazon stock, which is in the thousands of dollars per share, right? So that, that's number one. But with, also with bits of stock, you, you know, the stocks that you're actually starting to own they're funded by the brands. So yeah. if I'm, if I'm, you know, between the, most of our users are 18 to 24. So if I'm between the ages of 18 and 24 and I have, and I don't make a lot of money and I, I'm just living paycheck to paycheck, as you said, or I've, I've everything I've bought, I've used buy now, pay later platforms. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't have necessarily the money to invest and you might have some disposable income laying around to invest, but then how risky is it for you to just, you know, use that funds to just buy stocks. Right. So yeah, that, that threshold we overcome for a lot of people because the brands are paying for their first stocks. Wow. And, and you convinced them of doing that somehow. You know, I, I didn't, it's, 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 uh, it's an easy sell. You know, these, you know the, the challenge is getting brands to uh, think differently internally. That's, that's always the challenge okay. selling to corporates. Like getting corporates to, to move and try new things is always the challenge. But the, the value proposition, the idea of turning your customers into shareholders, it sells itself. Most people we talk to at brands are like, you know, it's an aha moment. They get it, really excited. Um, how do we do this tomorrow? Uh, well, you know, then you have to go through this corporate maze of, of people you have to convince and get, get buying from and, and sign off. So because it is a complex, you know, um, program. Yeah where you have to legal and financial structure, legal financial structure, right? You know, it's not just a marketing program. No. Um, but once people do use it and get it into, into place, they see the benefits immediately. So yeah, that's, that's always the challenge was with us working with brands is navigating the corporate landscape, not so much the product or the value proposition. And what should people be paying attention to when we talk about the finance, the FinTech world, where is it going next? Uh, you mentioned that it's now picking here in Europe. Uh, do you see something else, something new popping in the U.S. that's going to make the way overseas? Is there something that people should be paying attention to? Yeah, I think, you know, just this concept of fractional ownership is going to become very important, um, not just in our world of fintech, but in every kind of different types of economies that you have. So, for example, excuse me, if you look at the ownership economy, the shared economy, the creator economy, all these new types of economies and the new types of businesses and the new people that are getting involved they're going to require to monetize and, and raise money and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and that, that's not going to change. And I think fractionalization as a technology is going to enable, you know, creators who are, who are, who are making money to receive um, royalties um, based on their, their participation in that economy. Um, for people who are, sh- you know, purchasing um, assets and want other people to share and buy into the, some of those assets as well, fractionalization will become an important part of that technology. So for me, the trends that I'm watching are like secondary markets in a lot of these new asset classes in NFTs and collectibles, you know, so right now you can invest in a fraction of a share of a baseball card, you know, if you, if you wanted to throw an auction or a piece of painting and now that's yeah. being digitized into an NFT. And then where is that this fractional share? That's market's a whole nother from, world. Right. So, um, you know, th- I think the next generation of asset classes is what I'm really excited about in FinTech. And for the FinTechers that are starting now, so the ladies and gents that are now building their, their, their fintech companies, what do you have to say to them? What would be your first advice when starting a fintech company? Yeah, I think my first advice to anyone starting a, a company is really understand what it is you hope to achieve. You know, the one thing that you need to have as a founder, entrepreneur, is the vision. Like the vision has to be really strong. And that's not, that's not to say you need to know exactly how you're going to get to where you're going, but you need to know where you're going. 
And I think most VC, you know, and, and, and if, if you're, if you want to start a company that needs to be venture backed and you need to raise funds from a VC, that's going to be even more important, right? The vision of the founder. So, you know, whether it's fintech, any other industry, what is the vision for the company? And then as you start to build it out, you can figure out how to get there. But the vision is going to dictate, you know, what type of financing do I want to raise, whether it's structured debt, equity, um, who are the partners that I need to bring on as, as fundraising c- continues? What is this a lifestyle business? Is this a venture backed business? All that early on would be dictated by your, by the vision that you have for the company. And of course, you couldn't get here alone. Is there anybody you want to thank for like helping you in this journey? Of course, I imagine your team, but uh, anybody in particular that you're like, wow, this this wouldn't have been possible without. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think my co-founder Ryan Gary definitely wouldn't have been possible without without him, and and even one of our earlier co-founders, Colin Coons. Um, you know, we we. We started this very early on together, and you can't do it alone. I think as a founder, you need to have co-founders. That's 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 certainly true, and and you know that goes also with some of the in initial investors. You know those angel investors that give you those small checks from the start. You know that they're really taking a gamble, right? And and sometimes you need that that first five, ten, twenty k to to actually get to that next level of your business. So, really special thanks to, to our earliest investors um, and, and just the mentors that I've had. You know in this journey, I think. Finding mentors as a young entrepreneur is also very important to the su- success of your company, and eventually those mentors will become investors and people on your advisory board. But having those mentors early on will really help you, you know, have a good sounding board for for the judgment uh, calls that you make and the decisions that you make. So, um, yeah, really big thanks to some of our mentors. And and if Michael Duyas is listening, he's the one that scouted us for the fintech program and started Bootcamp. So, you know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't we wouldn't be in Amsterdam if it wasn't for Michael Duyas, Elizabeth Kleinfeld. And all the people that were involved in Startup Bootcamp on that scouting team, you know, finding us and bringing us here. So that's always a, a special thanks there. And we thank you for the, all the trust, man, and for being part of also the Startup Bootcamp history. We love having you here. And uh, I love have talk, having the time to talk to you. I think my time is basically over now. Okay. But it was a great conversation. And if you're listening and you want to follow us, um, we're always available wherever you get your most awesome podcasts. So Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc., etc. We're also available on YouTube. And don't forget to share this content with your friends and colleagues. And we will be back on the next episode. Thank you so much for being a part. Thank you for having me.